I had the chance to speak at the solid state chemistry Christmas meeting where I talked about using generative modeling. And the specific task we had there was making sure that what came out of the generative models was unique, right? Was interesting. Um, today, I'm going to talk about how actually you go about generating things in the first place, right? Um, but so before I do that, I do need to point out a couple people. Uh, the first is the people that made this work possible, right? I, I didn't do any of this. And so I Gratitude goes to my research group. I'm going to talk specifically with work from Sterling, from Michael, from Tran, from, you know, Zara, from a number of different people. I'll try and call out the individual people who did the work. Um, and then the second group of faces is this one, right? So this came from a tweet from Ian Goodfellow. Maybe some of you have seen this before. This was the guy who, as a graduate student, invented the generative adversarial network. And he was just tweeting this. And I actually had to add the 2021 one. I should probably add another one because it just continues to get better and better. But he was pointing out just the incredible progress and the rate of progress has been remarkable from the very first time that we were able to generate something that looks sort of like a human face to where we are now it has not been a very long period of time. And yet we can do some remarkable things. And I don't need to tell you how exciting it's gotten with the advent of ChatGPT and everything else. Generative informatics, generative machine learning has done some really powerful things. And one of the great things that we have being in an adjacent field of chemistry is taking advantage of the tools that are coming out of the CS field. For example, when it comes to generative models right now, there's just a, a wide variety of powerful things to choose from. Um, that said, if you try and use them, I'm, this is a silly example, but if I go to Dolly right now, right? And I say, give me, give me an oxide crystal structure with offset layers of corner shared ALO6 octahedra and rare earth filled interstitials. This is what it gives me back, right? Um, Right now, there was no way to use a generative model to get a repeating periodic crystal lattice, right? And now there were things that we could do that were sort of like that, but that was up until recently, not something that we could do. So uh, during COVID as well, this was a student of mine, Zara and Michael got together and they had this idea. They said, you know, when you try and use these models to generate new crystals, they've been able to build molecules, but not been able to build the full periodic structure. And so they said, you know, what if we just tried to predict the material that is in the CIV card itself? Right? If you could encode that material and, and learn it and then represent it and pass it through a generative model, you'd be learning new, new materials, right? And like I said, this is, if you look at organic chemistry, they're quite a bit ahead of us in predicting molecules, and there's many ways to do this, but they also face the same problem of trying then to make this periodic and crystalline, and there wasn't a good way to encode that information, and that may be much more important in, in many instances than just the molecule itself is how it crystallizes. So fortunately, there were two papers that came out about the same time last year. Um, we actually got beat a little bit by our friends at MIT in Singapore, who were the first ones to come out with this. We were just behind them. But these approaches are essentially the same approach, where you're taking the information in the CIV card and you're encoding it in a way that you can then pass that through generative uh, models. So I'm going to show you how that works um, and which model is sort of arbitrary. In theirs, they use variational autoencoders. We have done GANs and diffusion models, and I'll show you sort of the outputs of these things. Um, the point sort of to not bury the lead is that they're getting very impressive. They're getting very convincing and turning out things that look a lot like real crystals. Um, so let me sort of walk you through the timeline and the progress that's happened here. First, we started with the GAN architecture. If you're not familiar with GANs, these are generative adversarial ones. I'm guessing most people on this call are. But the idea is that you have two neural networks that are competing with one another. Um, they are, for, you know, for what they are, they're OK. They, they have a lot of problems in how they are divergent. It's much easier for the discriminator to tell a real crystal from a fake one. It's much harder for a generator to turn out something that's real. And there's some steps you can take to make that work a little bit better. For example, you can do a quick um, calculation of stability by passing your output sieve through something like a, a prediction of the convex hole distance, right? And if you toss out things that are far from the hole, it's a little more stable. But these are not great, but you can, with some work, get them to uh, stabilize and, and converge. Um, getting the information out of the sieve card is actually pretty simple. If you look at a typical sieve card, here's one for an inorganic material. There's not all that information that you need. It's right, ABC, it's alpha, beta, gamma, it's the space group, which encodes all the different symmetry operators, and then it's the basis. Um, so there's not that much unique information, and we have quite a few different tools that make it easy to extract that information. Things like PyMetGen make it easy to pull that stuff out of these cards. There's also a lot of databases, right? Whether it's the you know, Cambridge database or the ICSD or whatever else. We're here, we're using the Pearson database, which had 300,000 entries of which about half had the basis. Uh, the other ones didn't have the basis. They had the unit cell only. So we've got around 150,000 entries to learn from. So we have a data. We just need to figure out the right way to encode it. So here's how we did it in early days. We took and just made a matrix representation where we encoded the ABC, the alpha, beta, gamma, the space group. And then you had as many columns as you wanted to have available in the basis. 
for some crystals, that's a single atom defines its structure. For some, it can be, you know, the PCD, the biggest one we had was 200. So what we decided to do was, was allow up to 52 that incorporated the vast majority of compounds. And then we would pad it with zeros. If, and if a certain atom, you know, crystal structure had fewer than 52 unique atoms, we'd pad it with zeros. And then we averaged this over seven times. We did that because GANs are notoriously divergent. It's hard to get them to train nicely. We found that if we encoded the same information redundantly seven times and then took the average, it performed a little bit better, a little bit less terrible. Now, the first time that we tried this, my students send me the, best, the, the card and I go to open it and vest it and we both get an error message. And what we realize is that when the GAN produces this representation of material, it doesn't follow the rules that we as chemists know it ought to follow. For example, if it assigns a space group over 195, we know that that means it should be cubic. And yet, it might have said that A and B and C were not equal or that the angles were not 90. And so we did have to tweak some things. We had to introduce some constraints to make this follow some basic rules. Um, and having done that, it still was turning out um, some problems. For example, when it would predict which atoms to put in the basis, it was using regression. And so it would regress a value. So it would say, I think it should be atom with atomic number 13.44. And as you know, that doesn't make any sense. So at a first pass, I was like, oh, just round it. That'll be easy. But if you just round it, then you end up with a problem that it if it has up to 52 different positions to fill, it might choose to give you 52 different atoms, right? And following 100 years ago told us that that's a load of nonsense, right? So how are we gonna get around that? There's different ways. One thing you could do is you could do clustering, right? You could do a k-means clustering, k value of two, three, or four perhaps, and that will force all outcomes to be either ternaries, binaries, quaternaries, right? Which should improve things a little bit. All that said, with a bunch of work and with a bunch of error messages, when we finally got one of these to open up in Vesta, it was like this deeply disappointing experience. It was this one on the left here where it was like, I remember when we finally got the open, he's like, oh, check it out. And it was clearly a problem, right? I was so embarrassed. It's like, this was a good idea. I'm glad you tried it. Now let's move on to something serious because this is not going anywhere. And he insisted letting him try it a few other tries. And so you know, there's when we say GAN, there's many different architectures that you can implement. There's different uh, components that you can build into the structure. And he tried some things and it was getting, you know, mildly maybe-ish better, but certainly very, very far from convincing. Uh, and one of the problems that you're running into is that with this original GAN structure, uh, by the way, just to put it in this sort of timeline, I would say, yeah, this is about as much of a face as this is one. Like, it's not going to fool anybody. Now, and one of the problems that we ran into the original GAN architecture, the discriminator was using a sigmoid function. This is a super common one. It's very commonly used in GANs. A sigmoid's great because as the, you know, the representation gets compressed down to a single value, that value is the X value here. And then the discriminator takes that, pass it through the sigmoid, and if it's very negative, it learns that it's fake. And if it's very positive, it learns that it goes to one, so it's real. So it's a great discriminator. It does a great job of saying zero versus one, because there's only the small region that's in the middle where there's any ambiguity. So it's good for discriminating, but it's bad in that we use the slope, right? We use the slope here to calculate backpropagation, which is what tunes the neural networks to make both the discriminator and the generator do a better job. And so you have this so-called diminishing gradient problem, where because this, as you're getting more and more confident that you're turning out realistic structures, you're getting less and less useful feedback. It'd be sort of like running a marathon where you get tireder, right, and have to move slower the closer you get to 26 miles, whatever it is. So the good news is that there's many other architectures out there, right? You can change the activation function. This is Wasserstein GANs. Instead of taking that sigmoid, they change a few things, one of which is the way in which they evaluate real versus fake materials. The benefit here is that it's a linear decision each time. And so no matter what sort of thing comes out of the generator, whether it's nonsense or quite you know, good, you can get useful feedback to make the next round a little bit better. Um, so the benefit here is that by, you know, this was about a year old work here at this point, it was starting to turn out much more interesting structures, much more convincing ones. If you look at here, here's eight different structures. And my goal going into this, like, wouldn't it be great if we could actually turn out new inter inorganic structures that would fool our, our chemist buddies? And, you know, you wouldn't maybe quite here fool everybody, but you'd start to fool a few people because four of these are real and four are false. Now, if I told you the chemistries or if I gave you the average bond distance, if I ran them through Chexiv, for example, it would be, it would give the game away. They're, they're really still quite a ways off but they're certainly a whole lot better than what I ever thought this was gonna to get to. Now, one of the problems we were running into is that we were using in our representation just a number that represented the symmetry. And then we would pass it through, you know, PyMat Gen uh, to actually populate all the different positions. And what would happen is that we're frequently putting atoms 
just on top of each other. The, the bond distances were not respected in any meaningful way because we weren't encoding bond distances anywhere. We were trying to have that all be done with a single numerical assignment, which doesn't make a lot of sense. So we knew that to make this better, we're going to have to start to encode things like distances, right? So that changes our representation. Instead of being a redundant, you know, seven by, you know, 52 or whatever matrix, um, we had to start thinking about that same information we had before. But for every atom and its representation, we now need to make sure that it can interact with every other atomic position. Okay, so that means we need to make a direction graph. So in this graph, we're going to encode the same sort of information as before. The sieve information goes up here. We still have columns now that represent all the potential different unique sites in the basis. The same thing on the rows. But now we're going to learn their interaction one with another. One of the cool things about this is obviously you can do it just on one layer, just do a straight up pairwise distance if you want. Or if you want to make deconstructing it and reconstructing it easier, you can actually make different layers where the different layers might represent the distance along the X direction or Y or Z. In fact, you could keep on adding layers to add things like differences in electronegativity or difference in size. You could, add, you could start to encode chemistry in that way. So this was a paper that we published in the Journal of Open Source Software where we, where we described this technique. Again, one of the benefits of this is that not only is it is it a convenient way to encode that information so you can learn those representations, but it's also convenient because what the output is can be mapped over to an image, right? So we call this crystal to ping, and you can take a crystal and transform it to now a color image, and then you can pass it through these generative models that have been, you know, built to work very easily with image structures. It makes it very easy to adapt this over. Um, so you can take a look at that if you like. Uh, now, one of the problems that you run into um, is how you go about reconstructing these. So I showed you these graphs, right? We're going to basically learn in this direction graph, it's going to populate this representation as it goes through the general model with a, essentially not noise, but it's going to be learned values. But those might break some of the rules, and I'll show you how. For example, atom one, if we take our direction graph, atom one, if you look at the positions of atom two, three, and four in the x directions, we could populate our graph like so, right? It's some distance s away, maybe in the positive or negative direction. And, but we could do the same thing in Y and the same thing in Z, and we could do it for all the four different atoms. So from every atom's perspective, you know where every other atom is. Okay? Well, what happens then when this direction graph is learned as an output from a generative model? That means that you're going to have to backtrack where the atomic positions ought to be. So atom one, if you're trying to learn from atom one perspective, where atoms two, three, and four are, you'd look at the direction graph, what the values are, and you'd say, ah, they're there. That's where these things ought to be. But you have to remember that, okay, we also have the same instructions from atom two's perspective, where everything else is, and they don't line up exactly, right? From atom two's perspective, they're going to be just a little bit off from one another. And from atom three's perspective, they're going to be a little bit off. And atoms four, there's a little bit of uncertainty here, right? They don't all say the exact same spot. They often say quite close to the same spot, but to get the final value, you do have to do some averaging, is what we decided to do. We averaged it down to the average position, but we kept track of the uncertainties with our hypothesis being that bigger uncertainties means it was a less uh, well-performing model that it, and it, more tight uncertainties are going to be a better thing. Okay. That's how we went about dealing with the averaging of these positions. Now, obviously, GANs are just one way to go about this. You could also use diffusion models. Those are, have taken over the image space, right? If you use Dolly or Imogen or anything else, those are probably based off of diffusion models, uh, the ones you've used. And they're great learners, and they're, they're quite powerful. And you can do some additional things, which I'm not going to quite get into because this is unpublished work. But that's we, we have used a basic uh, diffusion model along with the GAN ones. So let's see how they do. Right At the end of this, now you can turn out structures that look really good. The atomic distances look much more realistic one to another. But how do you know what's good? Right? Are you going to look through each one of these outputs? And there can be millions and millions of them. And one by one, decide whether it's good or bad. Um, we need some good metrics to tell you where how, how efficient your generative model is. But one thing you could look at is look at that uncertainty. Right. For example, because we re repeatedly, redundantly en encoded things like the A and the B and the Cs or the uh, atomic positions, we can actually look at the uncertainty, like how much variance was there in predicting those things. And in these different models, here's what we see. So the top row is showing you the GAN performance, and it's showing you the uncertainty in the lattice parameters, and it's quite large. It's showing you the uncertainty in the space group squared, right? Really big. It has no idea what space group to assign to it, basically. Uh, and you see that across the board, it's pretty large variances. By the time you move to the Wasserstein GAN, these numbers come about an order of magnitude down. And by the time you go to a diffusion model, they go about an order of magnitude down further. It's getting much better. We are implementing this with BAEs and flow models right now, but they're not in our current publication, which you can find on Chem Archive. Um, and then just obviously, it's kind of in the pudding. When you look at these things, the vanilla GANs do a quite bad job. The unit cells are way too big. The structures don't look anything like real crystals, as we sort of saw before. 
And by the time you get to the Wasserstein GANs, these things look a little bit better. And when you get to the diffusion models, all of a sudden they're starting to look pretty convincing. Now there's some serious problems here. If you look at the chemistries, you'll notice that some of these don't make any sense. You know, barium, sodium oxide, that electron count doesn't make any sense at all. It's not electro, it's not balanced, for example. Um, and that's because all we've done in this first iteration is encode distances with our direction graph. We're now working on follow-up papers where we're encoding things like electronegativity or number of valence electrons. We're encoding some basic chemical rules with the hope that we'll be able to learn more reasonable. But at least the distances and the structures coming out of these are much more realistic. And I'll show you some examples of how I think they're better. Well, first off, yeah, where are we at? I think that we're sort of like here. In, in the world of generative models for inorganic materials anyways, we're way better than our first work. It's getting to the point where it's, in, it's interesting enough that you might want to be doing something with this crystal. You know, I presented this at the Gordon conference a couple months ago, and there's a couple solid state chemists right then in the room that saw one of these and thought it was interesting enough that they actually phoned home to their postdoc who had it made. And by that night at dinner, I had two groups telling me a group in Germany and a Tyrell McQueen's group at Johns Hopkins had both made these things and said, you know, by golly, it was the right crystal structure, right unit cell, the atoms were not in the right spots, but it was an interesting enough thing that it, it tempted some of them to try and make it. Okay. So how do we know how well we're doing? Uh, before I run out of time, I'll sort of talk about this. One thing you could look at is you could look at the distribution from which we trained and the distribution that the generative model outputs. So the, the sort of salmon colored data points shows the distribution of, I think this is showing atomic numbers. On the left, you've got the GAN versus the distribution. Team GAN versus the distribution. And on the right, you have the diffusion model. On the left, you see with the GAN that what we have, we have is what's called mode collapse. When it predicts things, it's increasingly calling everything. It doesn't know that oxygen is like the most common element. It's just putting everything in your transition metals or your, you know, actinides. Whereas the diffusion or the Washington GAN is using the whole periodic table. It's, it's throwing at everything, but it hasn't learned that some things like noble gases or oxygens are more or less prevalent but the diffusion model is. It's learning that not only is there breadth of things that are present, but there's trends. Now it's not perfect, but it's a big step in the right direction. And we see the same thing with space groups, right? We see mode collapse with the vanilla GAN. We see breadth with the Wasserstein GAN, and we see capture of the modality with the diffusion models, which is, uh, which is encouraging, right? And then one last thing that you could do to try and get an idea of how well it's learning is you could take the real crystal structures and you could use machine learning predictions of materials properties, right? So you have 50,000 real structures. We can machine learn things like band gap or modulus or things like that. And then we can take and we can generate 20,000 structures from each of the generated models and pass those SIF cards through the same sort of ML predictions, which again, have their error bars, but maybe as a, as a starting point, it's an okay comparison. And what we see is that the diffusion model tends to match more closely the real distribution shown in gray than either the blue Wasserstein GAN or dark red uh, GAN models on essentially all the different materials properties. So there's probably some other ways that we could look at to quantify the goodness of the outcome of these models, but these are some of the first steps we've taken. One of the things I'm excited about going forward is the same tools that allow us to then describe an image and have Dolly spit out a picture of whatever it is you want it to make. We can do the exact same thing here. We can type in a description of the chemistry, either directly say what, how many atoms, or you could extend this to actually have descriptions of the, the connectivity and the structure. And this is something we've just started working on where you can describe you know, uh, connectivity or types of polyhedra that you want to be present. And it can map those over to inputs as well. So you could go beyond just generating things randomly, but just like with generative models where you can encourage it to give you a picture of a cat standing on grass, we could start to generate models that are, you know, that have uh, conditions applied to them. They have conditioning, right? So the hope is that one day we'll be able to turn out something like this, right? In the future, uh, hopefully not too far future, we'll be able to ask for something like, give me an oxide with offset layers of corner shared AO6 octahedra and rare earth filled interstitials and get something that's actually somewhat reasonable. Um, if you would have asked me how close we were to doing this, you know, five years ago, I would have said, we're going to be a good long ways out. And what we're seeing now is that it's maybe not as far out as we thought. We're already seeing pretty compelling evidence and that it's going in the right direction. So, so that's my talk I have today. I'll, I'll finish with one last slide that if this was interesting and people want to learn more, we put up a ton of different resources on YouTube. We've got a whole playlist dedicated to materials informatics with 50 some odd videos that goes through all the aspects of this from the most simple up to the most complex stuff we're doing. And we've also got a podcast on material science called Materialism. So with that, I'm happy to take any questions folks may have.